We are approaching the Easter weekend, which represents a time of leisure for many and a more sacred period for others. Whatever your beliefs, let us be careful and safe in all we do over these four days. Inside the show today, we explore downtown Kingston as the city of possibilities and visit a place that's catering to the education of children with special needs. Welcome to another Thursday edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson. Stay with us. What are we are full of our roots and culture? That <laughs> was in Jamaica 60. Jamaica 60? What a piece of news, Miss Matty. I feel like my heart going boss up. Just in, the island of Jamaica is on the verge of celebrating its 60th year of independence. A holy way of celebrating it. <laughs> they said the people, them, you know, them come here, you know. But you see, when our people decide, say the other people, them free paper, oh no, them say if it's war, start it, whatever. We are collect medal, panther, you know? a medal. Come on, talk with you, them, you know? talk. The celebrations are slated to begin on January 1st, 2000. 2022 organized by the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. We have more in this report. I am on site and planning activities are ablaze. Persons are advised to download the Reggae Jamaica app to know what it pre. Why pre? <laughs> activities for the Jamaica 60 celebration. Yeah. If you don't know the app to get the updates then. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry and this is your JIS News for Thursday, April 14, 2022. President of the Republic of Rwanda, His Excellency Paul Kagame, addressed a joint sitting of the Houses of Parliament today as he continues his three-day state visit to Jamaica. The Rwandan president arrived at the Norman Manley International Airport in Kingston yesterday, where he was greeted by the Governor-General, Prime Minister and Chief of Defence Staff before meeting with other government officials. He later visited the National Heroes Park and laid a floral tribute at the shrine of national hero Marcus Garvey. The visit of President Kagame is expected to deepen bilateral relations between Jamaica and Rwanda. It is also in recognition of Jamaica's 60th anniversary of independence being celebrated this year. Effective tomorrow, April 15, pre-testing will no longer be required for travel to Jamaica and the wearing of masks in enclosed public places will be highly encouraged but not mandatory. The office of the Prime Minister released a statement yesterday announcing the end of the two measures that have been in effect since 2020 as part of measures to stop or limit the spread of COVID-19. As the pandemic continues, all other measures under the Public Health Enforcement Measures Coronavirus COVID-19 Order 2022 remain unchanged at this time. These include a requirement for persons who test positive for COVID-19 to isolate at home until they have recovered. Directions relating to the conduct of COVID-19 testing and the handling of samples and reports by private laboratories also remain unchanged, along with provisions to protect the identity of persons who test positive for the virus. Owners or operators of businesses, places of worship, educational institutions or other establishments to which the public has access are still required to ensure that hand-washing stations or hand-sanitizing equipment are placed and maintained at the entrance of the premises. The update to Jamaica's pandemic response comes as the country is seeing relatively low case numbers. However, pointing out that new COVID variants continue to emerge and some countries are experiencing increased cases, the Office of the Prime Minister is urging persons to take personal responsibility. Members of the public are urged to continue to exercise caution and voluntarily observe the infection prevention and control measures, including wearing masks in enclosed spaces to protect themselves and family members. Jamaica's tax and non-tax revenues continue to improve year over year. For the period April 2021 to February 2022, tax revenue was $516.7 billion. This is $2.3 billion or 0.5% below the third supplemental budgeted target. According to the Economic Program Oversight Committee, EPOC, this largely reflected lower than programmed special consumption tax and international trade receipts. But while the tax revenue was lower than budgeted, it outperformed the previous fiscal year and pre-COVID levels. It was $9.8 billion ahead of 2019-20 and um, $85.6 billion tax revenues ahead of 
up to the same for the same period up to February last year. So tax revenues really improving year over year. Similarly, non-tax revenue, which came in at $76.1 billion, was lower than budgeted, but significantly higher than previous years. But this non-tax revenue is um, significantly ahead of um, last year's number and significantly ahead of the pre-COVID levels by $20.2 billion. So uh, again, we're seeing recovery, um, but and, and um, but nominally in relationship, if you were to, as I said, um, account for inflation. For the 2022-2023 fiscal year, government is projecting to increase tax revenue by 10.8%, earning $671.5 billion for the period. Jamaica's international reserves remain healthy, which, among other things, means the country can remain liquid in the case of crisis and provide confidence for investors. During its quarterly press briefing on Tuesday, the Economic Oversight Committee, EPOC, reported that the country's net international reserves had declined since December 2021, but remained strong at $3.6 billion U.S. dollars. At March 25, 2022, there was gross international reserves of 4.3 billion US dollars, 138% of the level considered adequate. Our foreign reserves have been boosted by remittances, which have been doing very well, $2.9 billion up to February 22, year over year, right? Um, visitor arrivals, which have we see on the increase. Twelve members of the judiciary were sworn into higher office by Governor General Sir Patrick Allen during a ceremony at King's House this week. Tania Mott Tuller-Reed was appointed to serve as puny judge, while Pamela Mason, Stephanie Orr, Opal Smith, Dale Staple, Sharon Barnes, Althea Jarrett and Maxine Jackson will serve as acting puny judges. Meanwhile, Justice Evan Brown has been appointed to serve as a judge in the Court of Appeal, while Justices Georgiana Fraser and Kisok Leng will both be acting judges of appeal. And Tamara Dickens will serve as acting master in chambers. Governor General Sir Patrick Allen reminded the judges to always consider their oath to defend the Constitution and to act without fear, favor, affection or ill will in executing their duties. This is a crucial time in our history when we will be called on to closely examine and take actions in some of the provisions of the Constitution, I would want to think that it is incumbent on the judiciary to ensure that the legislative branch and the executive branch, of course, receive the best advice in order to make the best decisions. Justice Evan Brown responded on behalf of his colleagues, remarking that the honor was both humbling and inspiring. We view this occasion almost also rather as one of renewal and rebirth. It is honor that led us to respond to the call to serve in these various positions and not vain glory nor the possibility of riches. And finally, the Ministry of Education will be completing major infrastructure works at three high schools this fiscal year. Two classroom blocks with a total of 12 classrooms, as well as a wastewater system, are being constructed at Black River High. A wastewater project is also to be installed at Papine High School, while Kingston College is receiving computer labs and a library resource center. Minister of Education and Youth Favel Williams made the announcement during her contribution to the 2022-2023 sectoral debate in the House of Representatives on Tuesday. The infrastructure development projects are designed to enhance the teaching and learning environment for our students and teachers across all levels of the education system. The projects are geared, toward, geared towards the elimination of the shift system, the reduction of overcrowding in schools, and the provision of quality school spaces. Construction will begin on nine major infrastructure projects at the Cedric Titus, Bridgeport, Westwood, Albert Town, Newell, and Mount St. Joseph High Schools, in addition to Homewood Technical, Exchange All Age, and DS Infant. Procurement for construction services will also be done for another nine major infrastructure projects. 
These are planned for the Papin, Port Antonio, Denham Town, Nain, New Forest, Belair, and Aberdeen High Schools, along with Stony Hill Technical High and Boundbrook Primary. Several schools across the island will also benefit from fencing and electrical upgrades. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and the social restrictions that came with it, downtown Kingston was at the peak of being promoted as the place of choice to invest, do business and have fun. Somewhat delayed by the outbreak of the virus, several projects are still in the pipeline, ready to come to stream. Let's look at some of those that have already seen the light and the reactions of business owners and patrons. <laughs> I'm quite pleased um, with the, the development here because it offers a lot of um, just access to downtown right now. <laughs> the revitalization of downtown Kingston has been gaining momentum as the Urban Development Corporation UDC continues to partner with investors in facilitating the redevelopment plan. <laughs> As a result, significant physical transformation has taken place over the last decade in the area. One of the first was led by multinational telecommunication giant Digicel. It constructed its global headquarters and prime waterfront property sold by the UDC. Over on Hanover Street is the new Chris Kennedy's multi-story complex. This will increase the offerings downtown as the entity makes plans to open a supermarket on the building. This property was also made available by the UDC. And nearby is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Development being managed by the UDC. This multi-story building is now the Ministry's permanent headquarters. Bringing tremendous vitality to the recreational and gastronomy options along the waterfront is the Victoria Pier building, a variety of offerings for the taking. It's really good for downtown and they're loving it. I'm very encouraged that um, you know, the, the persons saw it fit to, to develop um, this part of the city um, next to the waterfront where you can really enjoy the ambience. Investment opportunities are on the market for a concessionaire to operate the food bazaar at Festival Marketplace and a developer for a multi-story parking garage. The uptake in business in the downtown area is being facilitated through the tax incentive program being managed by the UDC. It was developed to encourage the private sector to redevelop properties to stop urban decay in selected areas. The tax incentive program enables persons who own or lease property in areas defined as special development areas to access incentives to redevelop the properties under the 1995 Urban Renewal Tax Relief Act. As part of the redevelopment of downtown Kingston is regulating informal commercial activities by providing appropriate areas to do business in the market district. As such, the Red Rose Fish Market and Jubilee Market have been completed by the UDC on behalf of the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation. These will allow for smoother transaction of business for vendors and consumers. Adding to the sociocultural vitality is the craft market. Coming on stream is the development of the National Heroes Park and surrounding areas, Government Oval. The park will be the new location for the Houses of Parliament, for which the design has been selected from a public tendered competition. The redevelopment of downtown Kingston is being guided by the phased implementation of the UDC's Downtown Kingston and Port Royal Redevelopment Plan 2030. It is aligned to the Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Plan. 
Aspects of the plan already completed include the construction of a bus park, one component of a multimodal transport center, and the upgrading of St. William Grant Park. The corporation sees downtown Kingston as the city of possibilities, the ideal location for work, leisure, culture, gastronomy, and entertainment. So we really enjoy the downtown redevelopment because if not, we would have been somewhere else, and I hope it continues. I would love to see people come down downtown and help with the development because the waterfront is growing, it's getting bigger. And in any country that you go to, the waterfront and downtown is the most lucrative place you could ever have. The Urban Development Corporation, making development happen for you. To learn more about the work of the Urban Development Corporation, call 876-656-8031 or visit their website at www.udcja.com. You may also follow them on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Instagram or visit their information center on the ground floor, Kingston Mall, downtown Kingston. We head over now to the Child Assessment and Research in Education Center at the Micro University College to get an insight into the work being done to diagnose the learning needs of children. The Micro University College Child Assessment and Research in Education Center, a feat made possible by several major players, with renowned educator Professor Errol Miller leading the team, opened its doors in 1981 and over the years has grown to become the first point of contact in the diagnosis, evaluation and treatment of children with special needs in Jamaica. In 1975, the Ministry of Education mandated Micah College to educate and train teachers for special education. An advisory committee was set up by the college. The committee recommended that Micah establish a diagnostic and therapeutic center capable of diagnosing the learning problems of children with multiple disabilities and develop instructional prescriptions for teachers and parents. As psychologists, education specialists, and therapists began to provide services to students, they had to use tests from overseas. Many were not appropriate in content. The assessment of reading posed the greatest challenge. Reading is common to all areas. Students needed a test to be tested individually. The content of reading tests had to reflect the physical and social environments as well as the lived experience of children. First published in 1995, the Microdiagnostic Reading Test is an instrument for teachers, diagnosticians or professionals designed to assess the reading skills of children. Assessment results from this instrument is further used to design educational plans to meet the individual learning needs of the child. As societies change, more is learned from research and experience gained from practice. Instruments have to be updated, upgraded, and refined. Hence, the microdiagnostic reading test of 2018. So it's been a number of years since the first edition has been out. So this new version is an updated version in terms of the passages, in terms of the grade range that it covers, and in terms of the subtests that are involved. We're looking at a number of different aspects of reading. We're looking at a child's ability to distinguish sound in the words that they hear. We're looking at their decoding ability, their knowledge of sight words, reading fluency, and their understanding of what they're reading. One of the benefits of this new version, because we're looking at a number of different areas of reading, is that we can be much more targeted in the recommendations that we're um, creating for teachers and parents. So instead of just saying a child has a reading deficit, we can say maybe they need to learn more sight words, maybe they need to learn, um, pick up their fluency, 
uh, maybe they need to target comprehension. So we can focus on the specific area of reading that they're having difficulty with instead of just saying they have a reading concern. It's administered individually. There are three components. There's a sight word, non-words, and reading comprehension. It takes about roughly an hour to an hour and a half depending on the level at which the child is at. It varies because most of the children already come with reading problems. They are also aware that they have reading problems. So some are nervous, some have anxiety issues. So it's where I come into play, where I have to do some form of encouragement, let them know that the reason why they're doing this test, for me to know their strengths and their weaknesses so that I can help them moving forward. So after the test is completed, I go through and I score. So the test will now tell me the level at which the child is reading. So that also lets me prepare work packets, activities, worksheets, etc. for their level, for their specific reading need. It helped me to um, read and answer a story and answer a lot of questions. The MDRT the, um, is currently used in a number of countries across the region. It's used in a number of classrooms. Um, we, we have a number of teachers who come through to be trained on it so that they can pick up the reading challenges that they have in the classroom. So we expect that this new version will all similarly be used um, across the region. The new Microdiagnostic Reading Test 2nd Edition is now available. Contact the Microcare Center to register for one of our workshops at 876-929-7720-2 or by email at care underscore center at cwjamaica.com. Continuing on the care of children, Prime Minister Andrew Holness emphasizes the dangers of child labor and the need to end this practice. The culture of Jamaica is such that our, our parents would have instilled in us the value of work. And uh, there is nothing wrong with parents ensuring that children understand the value of work. But when that crosses the line to getting our children engaged in illegal activities, such as scamming, when that crosses the line to get our children engaged in illegal activities such as becoming involved in the illegal sex trade and human trafficking, when that crosses the line such that being involved in work deprives the child of the opportunity of education, then that is not the kind of child labor that any country can be proud of. Many of our parents continue to take children out of school to help them in the markets on a Thursday and on a Friday. I can well understand and appreciate the need for the support of the household so that you can go to school on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. But parents, you have to desist from doing that. The government has provided the resources necessary to ensure that children can remain in school for the full five days per week. And I encourage all parents, no matter how you are struggling, to take advantage of the support that the government gives through the PATH program and other means. There is no excuse for parents to take their children out of school to support them in any form of economic activity. It's always beautiful in Jamaica. 
everything usually be green and pretty. We have beautiful water. Temperature that is normal temperature, the water never cold. We've been into business for about 13 years. J-U-S-C, C-Triple-O-L, just cool. It's spelled with three zero. We make three different types of pudding. We make potato, we make cornmeal, and we make total. This is the cornmeal, okay? That's actually almost the last process. What he's gonna do now, he's gonna put the gel on top. Within no time, he has to take it off because the gel give it a nice taste. We have the people like Shelly and Fraser came here. We have, you know, you could name the biggest artists, Shabba Ranks, name them all. Being the man, they all come here and buy their food. This is what we grew up on. Now, when the people come to Jamaica, everybody, as soon as they land off the plane, this is where they come. They want to taste this pudding because it's bring them back to the old days. The long time days when they was kids growing up and they used to sit on the fire and watch their mama or their grandmother bake the pudding. We try not to change off our roots, we try to keep it that way. And not only that, we have a lot of love. Because we're all about love. This is where our journey ends, but only for today. Do join us again tomorrow when we'll bring another informative program. In the meantime, stay connected via our website, jis.glv.jm. And while you're online, send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at jis.glv.jm or via tweet at JIS News. You may also find us on all the major social media platforms and through our mobile app that's Android and iOS compatible. On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.